Okay, now uh, it's really interesting that you started because now you saw that pain, there is some circuitry, there is some organization in the spine, there, there are a lot of different things that we can study. And you will see that, I will repeat that very rapidly because I just have seven minutes and I will give you three hour talks in seven minutes and you will see, when you will go back at home, slowly it will come back during your dream and everything. Then what you see here, we go from the periphery, you have a nociceptive signal, you go to the spinal cord, at the spinal cord, Court, there is some integration. Also the thalamus level and, cort and cortex. And you don't talk of pain before it goes to the cortex. You, you talk about nociception. Why? Because at the cortical level, it may change. And someday, and this is a very linear vision, because if we would stay on this linear vision, we will cut the signal anywhere and we will be okay. And it's not working at all. In some cases, you can even have what we call anesthesia, but painful anesthesia in some lesion. Then something else is happening. What we have is we have central excitatory mechanism that will increase your pain centrally, and that's exactly what you just presented a few minutes ago. And with this central sensitization, you may do something about it. For example, you can block NMDA receptors. You can use anticonvulsant to block pain, in some cases, neuropathic pain. But you also have endogenous inhibitory system. You have in yourself, if you're not suffering right now, and I hope it's the case, it's because you have both no, not, you, you should not have nociceptive activation, but you also have another system that block the basic noise in the central nervous system. In some cases, you will see it's not working well. Uh, the way we measure that in the lab is we ask the subject to put their hand, we put a thermone on it, we just burn them, and we don't burn them, but we give a really, really painful stimulation. There's no danger, but they can report their pain. And as you can see in the blue line here, you can see that the person report their pain over time. And even if we keep the temperature at 46 degrees for two minutes, you see the increase that is happening. After that, we asked them to put the other hand in very cold water. We're having a lot of fun in this lab. And it's really painful for two minutes. It's what we call cold pressure pain. And after that, it will trigger some descending inhibitory system. And why do we know? Because we can block them. You can give naloxone and it's not working anymore. Oh, then it's probably opioidergic. And there is other things than opioid. There is serotonin, noradrenaline. Then maybe uh, some, uh, some antidepressant, for example, may help this system. And we will see it's the case. Then we ask the person to put their hand in cold water and then look at what's happening here. You have a reduction of their pain. And you can see with a very simple test like that in the lab, and we do more than that. We do brain scan, we do electrophysiology, we, we measure the autonomic nervous system, but I'm going to concentrate on the perception here. You can see that we can measure both excitatory system in the central nervous system and also the inhibitory system. This is excitatory, this is the increase of pain perception over time that varies if, if you were a group of research, that will be nice. The next time, that's what I will do. I will bring my thermode and water bath, and we will test you all and show you that there is a huge difference between one individual and another, even if you're not in chronic pain. And this is the inhibitory system. Let's take, let's take one group that I studied years ago, fibromyalgia, because they had a large pain over their body. It seems that the inhibitory system is not working well. And this is fibromyalgia before they put their hand in very cold water. And this is after. And as we can say, the mean told us that they have a strong deficit. I decided not to keep the other slide because I knew that seven minutes were short. But just trust me, when we measure, when we show each subject, we can see that almost half of them have a really good inhibitory system. And the other one, the other half, have increase of pain. When you make the mean, you see something like zero, but it's not zero. It's because they're different. Then if you give the same treatment to two patients who seems to have the same clinical tableau, you will have two different results. And that's, you see, that's what you see in your clinic all the time. Is there any other cases than fibromyalgia that have dysfunction of CPM, of this endogenous inhibitory system called, called CPM? Yes, chronic pain, uh, tension type headache, uh, uh, IBS, neuralgia, and the list is very long. And it's even treatment related. In some cases, if you give some opioids to some patient, you will see a decrease of the efficacy of their endogenous inhibitory system. And we almost never talk about that in the clinic. We talk about 
hyperactivity, but we never talk about the fact that the descending system doesn't seem to work in some cases. And I think it's a really big mistake, and I will show you why in a few seconds. Then there is a lot of studies. I ju I'm just citing here three, four studies, but there is now tens and tens of studies showing that if you want to predict the efficacy of anticonvulsant, you use spatial summation. If you have a patient suffering of chronic pain, you measure on them uh, thermal stimulation, and you see that there is an increase of spatial summation, there's a good luck that you will have a, a good effect of uh, anticonvulsant like pregabalin or others. If you want to predict the effect of duloxetine, for example, spatial summation is not a good test. But if you test the inhibitory system and you see that there is a decrease of the efficacy of this inhibitory system, then you will have a good, a good result. And this is important because this is two patients. Could be a boy or a girl, it's no, no problem. 43 years old, 45 years old, low back pain for a long time, 10 years, eight years, irradiation on the leg. You tried different things, acetaminophen, muscle relaxant, infiltration, opioids, whatever, and they still have their pain. You know, it's not working well, it's it's tough patient. You know, it's the kind of patient you see coming to the clinic and you say, oh my God, not John again. Hi John, how are you? No, I'm not good, okay. And, and now today we're gonna try this and that. This is the kind of patient that are tough to treat and you try to see what's happening. And they have the same clinical tableau. When you look at them, they're really similar, as a matter of fact, the two very classical low back pain. But if you push your testing just a little further, you do a little more clinical exam, you will see that one of them have a DN4 at this point. Both have DN4, you know, it's the douleur neuropathic 4, you know, this test that you can use to be sure that it's neuropathic. Both are positive, but one seems to have some uh, diffuse pain, the one on the right, they have, you have this low back pain, but you also have this diffuse pain also. And for some reason, you know me well, and uh, you're in Sherbrooke, and you say, Serge, would you test this patient in the lab for me, just, just for the fun of it? And I do it, and this is what I found. On the right, I see that the patient have a very increased excitatory system, and on the, on the left, uh, I think it's the, the contrary, on the left, it's excitatory system, and on the right is the inhibitory system that is the, the there's a deficit. And when you try your treatment by magic, anticonvulsant seems to work better on this one than on this one. You know, you know it's never this easy, it's never black and white, but it's probably another way to try to see what's happening, why two patients with the same clinical tableau will not respond in the same way to the same treatment. It's probably because the mechanism is just not the same, and this is one of the explanation. Then in conclusion, it's important to see what's happening neurophysiologically before we continue to treat the patient. All patients are different. And, and it's tough because I know that you will say, my God, you know, I, I, the diagnosis is good. I know what I'm doing. But uh, honestly, I, I have to do something else. Yes, but the, the thing you have to do, the, the things you have to add to that is not this complex. And also to finish sex and gender differences, genomic, environmental factors, social factors are important. But you don't have to measure all that. You, there's a few tests you can do, very easy one, that will change the way, that will change your success rate in the patient. Thank you.